Hey guys, we can probably get started. Sam? I think so. Good morning, John. My time zone is rather evening, but yes, wherever you are in the world, morning, afternoon, evening, really excited to get our SWE Move Programming Language AMA started with our very own CTO over here and co-founder of Mission Labs. I will let you introduce yourself, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Sam. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Mistin, and I'm the creator of the Move language. But let me tell you a little bit about my path to Mistin and into crypto. So I started off my career as a programming languages researcher. I was studying static analysis and automated bug finding tools. I spent all day doing fun esoteric math to build these tools and doing some implementation work to implement some of these tools and then run them on open source software and try to find some bugs and then report them to open source developers and see if they wanted to fix them. And sometimes they would, and that would be a great thrill. But mostly this was just fun math and not something particularly practical. But towards the end of my PhD, I had the chance to do an internship at Facebook, and there they were trying to take the same technology that we were using in the academic world and really try to make it work in production. This was back in 2014 when Facebook was making the transition from web to mobile, and they were discovering, hey, we got to keep bugs out of our mobile apps at all costs. And so they uh, invested in all sorts of technology to catch bugs up front instead of trying to do it after the fact. And one of the things was these automated bug finding tools that I was working on. So I got to do the same kind of research work I was doing, but put it put in front of tens of thousands of Facebook developers and get real time feedback about what they were doing. So it was a totally addictive experience to me. I was like, I really like working at this intersection of research and production. So after that, I joined Facebook and spent many years working on this. I made a bug finding technology and looked at all sorts of things like buffer overflows, data races, null to references, change analysis for security. And this is where I formed a lot of opinions about language design because we spend all day doing static analysis and trying to look for bugs. Uh, you think a lot about what are programmers trying to do and what gets in their way from the language design perspective. And also from a language design perspective, what makes it hard to reason about code, both for automated tools like the one I was writing for end users. And so I can talk about this more in a minute, but the story of Move is really one of taking a lot of these ideas about safety and languages and bugs and avoiding bad behavior by construction and just thinking about what is a language designed from scratch around trying to do these things look like. But so I'll fast forward this part. I joined DM effort at Facebook and created Move as part of that. This is also where I did a lot of work on protocol design and met the co-founders of Mistin. And then last year, we jumped out to form the company and started working on Sui and the new integration of Move that we have with Sui. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there because I want to take more specific questions, but that's sort of me in a nutshell and how I got to where I am now. Should we kick off with some questions? I think uh, Jen, you have a list. Yeah, so in case people aren't aware, we have our events chat on Discord that's available, that's being monitored. So if you have any questions to drop, please put it in there because if we have extra time, we're happy to go through that. And also make sure on the Twitter Spaces side, if you can just at reply to us, we'll be monitoring on that channel as well. So let's dive straight into our first question. So what is the development focus of the next stage of the project? This is a great opportunity to plug an announcement happening later today. I think it's officially dropping after the AMA, but we can uh, give some early info to the folks that happen to be here. Today, we're announcing the date for our upcoming incentivized testnet. It's going to start on August 1st. It's going to be organized in a series of waves that we're calling it waves to fit with the SWE based water theme. And each wave will have two parts. One is what we call a sync, which is an operational challenge on certain parts of the network. It might be validator reconfiguration. It might be about staking all of the core stuff that SWE is going to need to work. And then the other part we call a swim, which is a move development and a developer facing challenge. The first one there, um, some details that we're not quite ready to release yet, but uh, there's a code word that you'll be hearing more about in the future, which is happy bearers. That's going to be the theme of the first move related challenge. That's the big focus for us is getting the network ready for this incentivized test net, making sure the features and the stability are all there, making sure the developer tool chain and the, is ready for these move challenges, and then just proceeding through a series of waves that builds operational experience among the folks who are running the network, make sure we're ready to do incident response, make sure everything is secure and ready for mainnet, which we hope to get to before the end of the year. So that's our focus right now. We're very much in crunch mode but trying to get to this in some ways not. And what is the history of Move? I know that a lot of people have given their interpretations of it, but what really sets it apart from other programming languages like Solidity? Yeah, let me cover these separately, although they're closely related. So when I joined the, the Libra project back in 2018, I was given a very broad mandate, which was this time Libra was supposed to be this global blockchain power payments network, and then it's supposed to run arbitrary smart contracts. So, you know, we're all just Facebook people. We know some things about crypto, but mostly we're computer scientists. And so the prompt is, you know, discover what these smart contract things are, look at what kinds of programs folks are trying to write and look at what's the ideal way to write these programs. Should we take an existing smart contract language and try to retrofit it and, and make it safer and better? Should we try to take a mainstream language and turn it into a smart contract language? Or should we try to design something from scratch? And so we looked at all three of these options. And so the first thing we really looked at was, okay, let's try to retrofit a mainstream language. For any language, the most important factor is community, having lots of libraries, having lots of programmers who know it, having 
having lots of tooling, having Stack Overflow and all this stuff. So if you can tap into an existing language community, that's great. That's always a thing that you want to do. But what we discovered is that these smart contract languages, you can't use a mainstream language for a variety of reasons. They're just these basic requirements that pretty much no mainstream language satisfies. So one of them is determinism. Like when you have a smart contract language, the thing that you're doing is you're trying to run these transactions that multiple validators are executing and need to get the same answer. If your computation isn't deterministic, they're not going to be able to do that. So that takes a large, large number of conventional programming languages off the table because they don't have determinism built in and it's very hard to retrofit a language to take away determinism. You could imagine in most languages something like iterating over hash map is not deterministic because it'll depend on what addresses are in the hash map and you don't know if there's a hash map being used somewhere deep in a library of some piece of code that you're using. So you basically just like can't use programs and that language won't be safe. The other thing is that smart contract programs just look very different from mainstream programs. It's a lot more different. They're very much centered around assets. You have like a typical transaction is going to take some assets as input. It's going to read them. It's going to write them. Maybe it'll transfer them. And then there's also these concepts of authority. Like there's someone who's an owner of the asset and then there might be someone else who's an owner. But these things don't exist at all in mainstream languages, which are a lot lower level. There's no, there's nothing that represents an asset. There's nothing about authority. There's no persistent state. There's no accounts. There's nothing like transactions. And then there are all these things that you probably don't need. So what we thought is, okay, although it'd be nice to use a mainstream language, like you basically have to take such a large subset of the language and build tooling that enforces it, that that's going to end up being much more complicated. And then, so of course we looked at, okay, let's, let's look at Slivy in the EVM. Let's see what's out there and let's see what goes well with that. And there too, we discovered that this has one of the major problems that mainstream languages have, which is these programs are all about assets. They're about coins. They're about NFTs. They're about money. Yet in the language, there's no type or value that actually represents an asset. The, the data model of assets is you have a hash table somewhere. The user addresses are keys in this hash table and the bytes of the assets or values in that hash table. And if you want to write a program that's trying to say, pass an asset from one user to another, you don't call a function and pass that asset to the procedure. You go into the hash table and you know you muck around with some bits that tries to transfer the thing around. So it just makes it hard to do the very basic things that you'd naturally want to do in code that's using assets. So it's things like passing an asset as an input to a procedure, returning an asset from a procedure, putting an asset inside a data structure, wrapping an asset inside another asset. In Solidity and Ethereum, you can't do any of these things because there's just no representation of assets. The language is, there's no types at the, at the low level. Everything is just bytes. And so you can't have these notions. So with Move, the main thing we were trying to do is, okay, this is the key concept of smart contracts. Let's provide the right abstractions for programming with assets and let's bake them into the language at the lowest level. So we have this notion of resource types where you have something that looks like a struct in an ordinary programming language, but it has these nice protections that are all the things you would want from an asset in the physical world. Things like you can't just create this thing from scratch. Uh, that's a privileged operation. You can't copy this thing uh, either on purpose or by accident. And, you know, normally when you write let x equals y in a programming language, what you're doing is you're actually copying y. But of course, if y is a coin that has some real world value, you don't want to copy it. It's very important that the old value of y can't be used anymore and that the y is sort of in one place at a time. Another protection that we focus on is you don't want to accidentally destroy assets. If you're passing a coin around a program and you just forget to return it, uh, you don't want that to actually get dropped on the floor and destroy value. That would be very unfortunate. We have these resource types where you get all these guarantees and you get these guarantees via type system at the bytecode level. So they can't be subverted by malicious programmers or by mistakes. These are just part of your bill of rights as a move programmer. So that's the, that's what we focus the design of the language on. And I think the thing that is the biggest advantage over a split in the EVM. There are many, many other things that we also try to improve. There were and still are lots of security issues with EVM programs. Like this reentrancy thing is a very large problem. Back at the time we were designing Move, the DAO hack was something that was on everyone's minds, which was totally related to reentrancy and also with trying to re-implement a scarce asset and doing so unsafely. So in Move, every function call is static. You know exactly when you call a function, you know exactly at compile time what code is going to be called directly and you never get surprised by some attacker trying to inject malicious code in the middle of your call frame. It just makes it a lot easier to write safe code and for folks who are trying to look at code and determine if it's safe, like auditors, to do their job more quickly and to build advanced tooling like the Move Prover that reasons about code. So with Move, like fitting my static analysis background and the, the background of many of the other folks on the Move team who work in static analysis and program verification, we've co-designed the language with a tool called the Move Prover, which is a really advanced formal verification tool where you write properties that are crucial for the correctness of your program, like maybe only this person should be able to access this resource or call this function the total number of these objects in the system should be 10. This thing should exist until this time and then it should be destroyed. And then the prover checks for you that these properties hold across all possible transactions, all possible program executions, no matter what any attacker or anyone else does. So this is very, very powerful and it's sort of like the, the high
highest criterion for excellence and correctness that you can have. And it's something that's just integrated with the compiler and with the move tool chain as a whole. So this makes it much easier to write safe code, makes it easier for auditors because instead of looking at the code, they can all they have to do is look at the specs and run the prover and ensure that you've specified the right things and the tool chain is working correctly. And it just we think it's going to make it much, much easier for programmers to focus on writing the code they're interested in writing and worrying less about these esoteric security issues that come up with things like grant currency. So that's what we were trying to do when we created Move and what we worked on at DM and Novi. I think there's a lot more to say, but uh, I think I've answered the two parts of this question. So let me move on to other questions. I'm sure there, there are other bits that I'll get into later. Well, moving forward, why do you use a custom variant of Move? Is there a big difference between the core Move programming language? Yes. So we actually don't use a custom variant of Move. The nature of Move is an interesting language where it, we've intentionally designed it as this cross-platform language where there's a core language that isn't specific to any blockchain and is very, very minimal. It has things like structs. It has booleans and integers. It has addresses, but it doesn't have a notion of accounts or transactions or the cryptography that's used by a given platform or the consensus that's used by a given platform. All these things are abstracted away. And it's actually just a, a small core language that doesn't say anything about blockchains at all. You could actually use it to do lots of different things. And then when we want to use Move in a particular blockchain, whether that's Sui, whether that's Starcoin, whether that's Aptos, whether that's OL, which are all platforms that are using Move, you can instantiate Move with some behaviors that sort of specialize it for your blockchain and what it's trying to do. And we think this is a really important part of the language compared to some other smart contract languages, because if you have something like the EVM, it overfits to so many implementation details of the way Ethereum works. So all of the things I just mentioned, like you know, the addresses, the account structure, even the consensus to some degree, the, these get baked into the EVM. And so if you're trying to build a next generation blockchain that's trying to address some of the limitations of Ethereum, you kind of have to inherit them if the EVM overfits these features, which makes it hard to build new blockchains that scale better than Ethereum does or that have new cryptography that Ethereum doesn't use or just have accounts that work in a different way or just otherwise trying to innovate. And so for Move, is very important to us that we didn't tie Move to just one platform and make it so that you're stuck with the design decisions that platform has made forever. We want to give creators of new platforms a lot of leeway to experiment with different things so that we can push forward the Web3 space as a whole. But at the same time, you shouldn't have to learn one new blockchain per platform that you go to, which is sort of the state of the art now. You know, Solana does its own thing. Ethereum does its own thing. If you go to Polkadot, they have their own thing. Like, you know, Nier has this different wallet based thing. If you have one language per platform, that's not a good recipe for creating a vibrant developer community, for creating reusable tooling, creating libraries that can be used everywhere. And so in Move, we're very much like, this thing has to work on lots and lots of different platforms that look very different under the hood. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to build those vibrant communities. And so, right, what we've done from the beginning is think very carefully about core move and not overfitting to details of a platform and then have really nice features for specializing move in a particular platform. This is a long-winded way to come back to the original question, which is that there's no default move and then so we use a different one. There's a default move that can't be used in any platform. There's a specialization that was used in the original DM and then we're doing a very different specialization in SWE. And I'll now talk about some of the things we're doing that's different from the original DM specialization and why they're useful. So in DM originally, this thing was supposed to be a regulated payment network that didn't really do arbitrary smart contracts but had like very, very tight restrictions on what accounts could exist, the kind of objects that could exist in those accounts, and the rules for moving stuff between accounts. So there are decisions that were made, like you can't send an object to another address unless that person beforehand says, I would like to give my permission to receive objects of this particular type. And that was appropriate in that setting because, you know, there were things like capital controls. You couldn't have an account to opt in. You couldn't have an account to receive U.S. dollars if they're in a certain jurisdiction. So it was very important that someone couldn't send them U.S. dollars without their permission. But in the open Web3 world, like this is very unfortunate. Like you want to be able to airdrop NFTs to someone or send them tokens or do all sorts of or give them things without them having to explicitly opt in beforehand. And so in Sui Move, we allow you to, we allow you to do that. Objects have transfer as a built-in capability. And so it's not something that you, when you create an object or an NFT or anything in Sui, the transfer functionality isn't something that you have to implement yourself. It's just built in as a feature of the platform and is also very performant. But you can still do things like if you have an NFT that you want to have a restricted transfer policy, like maybe you can only transfer it after a certain date to avoid speculation, or maybe you want royalties to be paid when it's transferred, then there's a way to encode that instead. But by default, everything can be transferred freely, which makes it much easier to build an open platform than DM and the other platforms that use DM style and instantiations of move. Another thing was that we've been talking a lot about object centricity and how important assets are to move. And the way we integrate into DM, we really achieve that from the programming perspective. But then from the end user perspective, in terms of how transactions look to a user, it wasn't quite there. Like the function signature for a transaction would still take only a string or an address or a Boolean. It was very 
very hard to see, like, what is this transaction actually going to do? What objects will it touch? And so in Sweeb, transaction model is asset centric. When you have a transaction, it calls a particular function that's published on chain, and that function takes structured objects as input. So if you have something like transferring a board ape, the function will be called transfer, and then it'll have a type in the function signature called board ape. And then if maybe you're putting that board ape into some kind of NFT marketplace, then that marketplace would also be an explicit signature of the transaction. And the transaction can only touch these objects that come in as inputs. So when you look at a transaction as an end user or as someone who's working on tooling, it's very, very obvious which objects that transaction is going to touch. And then via moves type permissions, what it's going to do with them. Is it going to mutate it? Is it going to transfer it? Or is it only going to read it? And we think this really makes it a lot easier to take the advantages of move and push them deeper into the stack so the tooling can see them instead of just running the code and seeing what happens, which is the way it worked in DM. One other significant change we made, which I think is very important for NFTs, which are something that we weren't thinking about a lot when we designed the original move, but has obviously grown in prominence a lot in the broader crypto space, which is you need the ability to create what are called heterogeneous collections. These are collections where they have elements of different types in them. When you have something like an NFT collection or a marketplace, it's not the case that every NFT below it would have the same move type. The, that would be inconvenient. You'd like to be able to have a collection that has a painting in it and then maybe some associated audio or something else. And these are all different move types with different fields that can be distinguished. But in the in the way we integrated move into DM and in the core move language, all collections have to be homogenous. That is, they all have to have objects of only the same type. So in Sweet Move, we solved that problem by having an explicit object hierarchy. Each object has an owner, which can be an end user's address. But it can also the owner of an object can also be the ID of another object. And so this lets you create parent and child relationships between objects and represent something like an NFT collection as you have a parent object that represents the collection, and then each of the each of the things in that collection are children of that object. The recording NFT might be one child, and then the painting NFT might be another one, and then something else might be another one. And then this also lets you have very, very large collections without paying for accessing every element in the collection each time you touch it, which is the way it worked in the old instantiation. So those are some of the highlights of what we've done in Sweden move that we think goes beyond the original instantiation of move into DM. But we also have lots of other ideas and interesting things to do here in the future. And I'm also very excited to see what other folks are going to do with move when they create new move powered platforms. It's really part of the ethos of the language that we give you the base of really nice and safe abstractions for programming with objects and with assets, but that we want folks to be really creative in the way they use it when they're creating new move powered platforms. Well, we have a question where some of the users have said or asked rather, does move present objects to the user in a different form? And and to elaborate on this question, the particular users have said that after studying the documentation, it's actually not very easy for them to perceive the objects. Also, for you know the end user to not really know how many objects are on the wallet for which one pays for gas that's being sent. And they also want to know, like, you know, where the tokens are. So there's a lot of questions actually just tied to it. But long story short, how does Move present objects for the user in different formats? Got it. So I think this question is maybe referring to how things are displayed in the Explorer. And the way we focused our early work in the Explorer, like, you know, you can go to explorer.sweet.io and take a look at this for yourself. You have a lot of information about what's going into each transaction. You have the ID of every object. You have the function that's being called. You have which object was used to pay for gas and things of this nature. And then what I hear the questioner asking is that this seems like too much information for end user. And I agree with that. Like the Explorer so far, the thing you have to have first on a platform is builders. And builders really need all of this information so that they can decide decide which coin to use to pay for gas so they can debug what went wrong so that they can have the full details. So the features we focus on in the Explorer are really about facing features that make it easy to do all these things. And I think even going forward, like the Explorer is probably a little bit more for power users of blockchains than it is for end users. Something like a wallet, which we're working on now, like I think we'll have exactly the experience you're describing where you abstract away a lot of these things and you only show the relevant details of what the user cares about. As you said, like the tokens that are going in, the, the decks that you're going to interact with or things along these lines. We've been working on a lot of these things in our suite wallet. And I think uh, I'd be very pleased with the user experience and how much of a gentler and sort of more abstracted view of what SWE is doing, what SWE transactions are doing, this will end up presenting to you. Just to say one particular thing about a wallet feature I'm excited about is we're working on this thing called human readable signing requests, where a big problem in Ethereum and in Solana and actually in every other blockchain I know about, including other move-based blockchains, that I kind of got at this earlier, is that when you look at a transaction, and you look at what it's doing, there's a name of a function that's called. You don't really have any more information than that about what the function does. 
devices. And so this makes it very hard to create secure wallets because it's not possible to ask an end user and be like, oh, go and look up the code for that function and then read through it and see what it does and make sure it's doing the right thing with these parameters or those parameters. That's just always going to be too difficult for an end user who's not a technical person. So this leads people into a lot of scams. Like recently, there's an issue in the board. Apes. Like basically people sign things because the signing request comes from a trusted source, not because they actually know what the signing request does. Like recently, there was this hack in the board apes community where their Discord got hacked and a mod said, hey, there's a giveaway that's happening here. Connect your wallet to this transaction and sign it and we'll drop you a limited edition thing. And a lot of people did that because they trusted the source of the message, but it turned out that the Discord had been hacked and then a lot of people's apes and money and other things got stolen. And so what we really want in SWE is that we don't want to have to rely on trusted sources of signing requests for things to be safe. What we'd like is we want the signing request from a tooling perspective to be human readable, to give you permissions like you'd get in Android or iOS where it says, hey, here's a signing request. This would like permission to read your board ape. And then you say, okay, that's harmless because it can't be transferred away or stolen. So I'm happy to approve that. Whereas if it's someone's Discord gets hacked and then they send you a message that they send you a signing request and the tooling says, this is supposed to be doing a promotional giveaway, but it would like permission to transfer your board ape. You might say, hey, now, wait a minute. Like that doesn't seem safe to me. Like all I want, to, all I should need to do is to read this so I can get my promotional thing, but it's asking to transfer it. I think I'm probably not going to sign that. So we're going to have a feature like this in the Sui wallet. And we think this is going to make Web3 wallets much, much less intimidating and unsafe to users because they don't have to worry as much about all these scams and nasty things that can come along. The tooling will protect them by giving them permissions that are very much used to what they have on a normal mobile platform. Like an Android app would ask you if it can access your phone book or your microphone, your location or these things. This is the vocabulary that the user can understand. And that's what we want to use, this nice structured representation of SWE and SWE move to provide at the object level so that we can service that information to users. So long story short, to answer the question, like I think you're right that the Explorer isn't trying to provide the curated end user experience that we want, but we're definitely going to be doing that on our wallet, which we're excited to showcase soon. And uh, we have the platform features to really make this, I think, a better experience than it is elsewhere. So everyone stay tuned. Know that the wallet announcements will be coming up shortly and we'll share it across all our channels so you can check it out. In addition to this, so Sam, will Sui's standard library also provide a random generator? Uh, Low-level questions. These are my favorite ones. <laughs> so I think eventually, yes. So if you're a, a nerd and follow Sui Consensus, you know that we use Narwhal Tusk. And if you've read the Narwhal Tusk paper, there's a variant of Tusk that uses what's called a common coin for generating randomness from the consensus process. This isn't a feature that we've implemented yet, but once we do, we will actually be able to have randomness as a platform feature that can be exposed via move. And this would be a huge thing. There, There's not another, at least to my knowledge, another chain out there that has secure randomness of the insecure randomness is a different story that I want to point fingers at as a platform feature for smart contract programmers. In the meantime, though, there's still lots of other ways to get randomness, even though it can't be a platform feature. We've been working on some CryptoKitty style genetic programming type things where you need randomness as part of the equation. And there's something interesting we can do there where when you have a transaction, right, it obviously has a hash. And then that thing on its own is not good to use as a source of randomness because the user can control what goes into the transaction and then shift the hash. But you can also set it up so that randomness incorporates both the transaction ID and a field on chain that a lot of other folks have access to. And then it makes it very, very hard to predict what the random number is going to be and then what the result of hashing this on-chain value and the transaction hash is going to be, and then makes it very hard to gain the randomness. So I think this is a thing that's a little bit hard to explain in detail with a, a diagram in the code, but we have some nice approaches to randomness that work in, in certain cases. And then in the long term, we're very excited to provide this as a platform feature. And then we actually have a series of questions from multiple users who've asked about learning Move. Are we offering tutorials? Is there an easy way for beginners to essentially learn this language? Yeah, so let me talk about a couple of different ways I would answer this question. And it sort of depends on where the learner is coming from. So the feedback we get, uh, this is actually feedback we got from a partner recently, is that if you're coming from the Solidity world, it's very easy to learn Move. The estimate we got is that you can pick it up in about four or five days compared to, say, like months for trying to learn the smart contract programming framework of Solana. So I think that's probably the best possible background. There are some idiosyncrasies of smart contract programming that are fundamentally hard, just the kind of code that you're trying to write even. So I think the ideal background is to be someone who's a smart contract programmer from elsewhere. Four to five days is a very short time to learn any programming language. We also think it's very approachable for folks coming from more of a Web2 background who are approaching smart contract programming for the first time. There, the idea is that they'll try to write some code and the fact that Move has this strong type system and a very opinionated compiler will guide you toward doing the right thing where it might be a little bit difficult to get your code to compile at first, but the tool chain is designed to guide you toward getting code that works. And then once it does work, it'll be secure and you won't have to learn the hard way about 
know, these issues like reentrancy or other security issues that crop up if you're going to instead start with solidity. And I think Move is particularly approachable if you've used the Rust language. Uh, you can, if you're a Rust fan or if you've written in Rust and you look at Move, like you see a lot of syntactic similarities. We do that intentionally when the feature in Move is very similar or equivalent to the, the same Rust feature. And then we have intentional syntactic differences where something is quite different in Move just to remind folks like, hey, you're in the Move world here. Don't think that you're in Rust and assume that it's going to behave the same because it will not. But we, especially in terms of the type system for references, which we call the borrow checker, Move has a much simpler version of Rust version of the borrow checker that'll be familiar to Rust programmers, but hopefully also easier to learn if you're coming from scratch and trying to see how all of that fits together. We're very concerned with making Move easy to learn no matter where you're coming from, and we're working on a variety of tutorials and educational content that hit those. We have one out now that I'd like to plug and can drop a link in the chat or perhaps someone on our team can. There's a series called Programming with Objects that was written by one of our Move team members that walks step by step into how do you get into Move via the particular lens of this friendly variant of Move that we're using in SWE and talks about how you do all the different things and has lots of nice code examples. I think that's probably the best possible introduction that I know of. And then this can be supplemented by looking at the Move book. There's both a Move book that's created by the Move contributors that's hosted on the Move GitHub repo. And there's lots of links to that in our SWE docs. And there's also move-book.com, which is written by one of our team members, uh, which is another book that goes end to end through all the features of Move. For me, I always like to start with tutorials or examples. There's also a, a directory called SWE Programmability slash Examples that has fungible token that has example code of fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens and NFTs and marketplaces and games and like all the sorts of things that folks write on smart contracts. That's really good too if the way you like to learn is by looking at code and then trying to imitate it or modify it. But I think we have lots of good resources available, but there there's much, much more that we would like to do and that we will need to do to build a vibrant move community. Laddering on to this, Sam, the good news is that our own internal engineering teams, they are very enthusiastic. They want to get that information out. So I know that in the coming weeks, at least, we are also working closely with them to see how we can provide different types of learning materials, whether it's through walkthroughs that are screen recordings, where they're taking people step by step. There's also the fact that we're looking into creating them into GIF formats with blog posts that actually outlines how it's being done in step format as well. So in terms of the, the chat that we have here, we're happy to take suggestions and recommendations of how you as the community would like to learn, because this will also help us in terms of how we want to structure the learning materials and make sure that we're sharing this information in a way that's digestible and easy for you as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Jen. I, I totally echo that. Like the most important, like we produce the resources that we think are best for learning move. We're also coming from an odd place being the creators of the language, people who are working on designing it, folks who are very deep in it. So we very much appreciate the feedback on what's good about our existing documentation tutorials, what's missing, the things you'd like to see, and the things that would be most helpful to you. We really need your help with that and appreciate it greatly. So going along with this line of thought, actually, you know, what kind of community development plan is there, especially because we know that our developing community is super critical for our project on Sweet. Yeah, absolutely. So in SWE, we're taking a multi-pronged approach to this. So this sort of gets a little bit into our go-to-market strategy, which is then also related to the community. The use cases we're most excited about on SWE are things where there's somebody who's trying to build a use case that caters to a large user base, you know, tens of millions of users and has heavy traffic. And these are the sorts of things that you just can't do elsewhere, I mean, on existing blockchains in a cost-effective way, and in some cases, not at all. And so one of the things we're really excited about is gaming, where if you look at a lot of our early partners and a lot of the early things that we write about and talk about. This is a case where gaming is already a business that's built largely around digital assets. And so there are very natural synergies with NFTs and with turning some of these in-game assets into on-chain assets to get broader access to liquidity for interoperability across different games by the same publisher and for doing cross promotions with brands and other interesting things like this. So we're doing a lot of work with game studios, both large ones and small ones, to figure out how can they leverage the unique capability of SWE to bring Web3 features, including NFTs, also including other interesting ideas like on-chain anti-cheat checking or or creator monetization or other things along these lines into their games and make all of that work. So we think the key pillar for us in building community is you just need a lot of users. You need a lot of big players like these gaming companies on your platform and ideally that have a lot of end users. You know, games are so huge that you pull a couple of large games and you probably have more users on your platform than all of Web3 combined. And then you show the utility of what having a blockchain and one that really scales can provide for this audience. At the same time, we care a lot about things other than gaming. Like traditional, a lot of things that make Web3 appealing are the economic engines of Web3 that are going to 
come more from the smart contract developer audience, things like building DEXs, things like building NFT marketplaces. We want to make it really easy for folks who know how to build these things on other platforms to do that on SWE and then to build next generation versions of these things that are leveraging SWE's high performance and unique capabilities and the nice move programming model that we have. And then there's another class of ecosystem enablers. You know, this is things like having good read APIs that developers can use to serve their applications or querying for events that happen on chain and doing on chain analytics, bridging to bring liquidity and NFTs from other platforms to SWE. These are also things we're working on on the partnerships and community building side. And then of course, there are folks who are not necessarily builders and they're not necessarily partners, but they're excited about being a mod in the SWE community or like evangelizing SWE use cases or the SWE token or working along or following SWE on social media or writing about SWE and educating folks about how things work. All of these are super valuable to us. And so community isn't just one thing, like we need to think about what SWE needs and then also just meet people where they are. What are they excited about and how how can they help us? Uh, so as you can tell, I'm the CTO and technical person and, you know, have a certain view on this. But I think I would also like to hear what Jen has to think about this as someone who's very involved in all of these things and as someone who's, uh, I think, more experienced and articulate about these matters. You did a reverse card on Uno to me, so I was definitely not expecting that. Thanks for doing this. Well, in terms of community, I, I would say so far people have been really upfront about things that have been going wrong. I really appreciate the fact that people have reached out to me privately about things that have to be fixed, or if we haven't been as reactive. I know, for example, Full Node, we were just drowning in the reception from the community. And obviously, when we go live with things, things do break or there's, there's issues that we have to fix. So while people have been also super upfront about the issues that we have. I would also like to point out how patient everyone has been when we're trying to address these issues. So in terms of our community program, what we're doing is I'm also very happy to say that we recently brought on a lovely developer relations lead who will be helping with a lot of the programming that we're doing. Brian, he will also be on an upcoming AMA shortly. But through him, we're going to also build out proper programs. So I know that the mod program itself has been a bit slow. We are still going through applications, I want to highlight that we received over 500 applications, which is an insane number in that short amount of time. So we want to have the respect of reading through each of the applicants and, and providing feedback as we can. So our programs are not just based on mods. We're also looking through in the future of how do we bring on creators who have really great visualization. I know a lot of you guys are super talented with graphic design. And last, but certainly not least, is also how do we bring in regional people who have expertise within their local markets and, and can help us really make sure that our translations and our information is accessible to people who aren't primarily English speakers. So we're looking at all of these to make sure that we're not only posting our own channels, but we're making sure that the materials are accessible for people who might want to share it within their own respective communities, because a lot of you I know also have a lot of credibility that you've built, whether it's through Telegram or Twitter or your own specific Discord server. So we don't want to stop that train and we, we certainly want to make sure that the materials are there so that you can get the information out. Hopefully that answered some of the questions regarding our community initiatives and how much we're trying to make sure that we're, you know, not being blockades and we're working with you hand in hand. So thanks for that reversal, Sam. Well, you handled it very gracefully. Thank you. And I think going to another question, in terms of the strengths of SWE, the question we get a lot, but I think it's going to be interesting to get your perspective on this, is what makes us different from others? Specifically, what is the strength of SWE? Yeah, absolutely. If I had to say just one thing, it's that SWE has really been designed from the ground up to be able to handle growing demands and to keep fees stable and the network stable as demand grows. You know our founding team, like a lot of us came from Diem and Novi, where we spent many years building a nice blockchain there. But I got into this a little bit while I was talking about my origin story. Like this blockchain was designed to be an interbank settlement layer that had like hundreds of vast that mostly did transactions off chain for privacy, but then eventually would do some payments on chain with some compliance checks. And so what we designed there had some good things about it, but it really wasn't designed to scale to handle arbitrary smart contracts and to have a validator software that could go beyond multiple machines and use sharding or to do really high throughput beyond a couple thousand transactions per second. So we thought that was all that would be needed for the payments use case. So when we started Mistin, of course, like we thought about building on top of the DM platform, but we knew about these limitations of it because, you know, we, we had worked on the system and we knew what it was designed to do and what it wasn't. And we looked into how could we extend it to handle all of these tough challenges of 
running a high throughput L1? How do we do with state bloat? How do we do sharding? How do we do horizontal scalability? How do we make the developer experience better? And we just thought, you know, this wasn't designed for it. And there are really fundamental decisions that if we did it differently, it would make a lot of these things easier and would enable a lot of the things we wanted in terms of SWE. And we knew we needed this because at the time we were talking to lots of partners, especially on the gaming side, and they're saying, hey, like, you know, I've got 10 million users. I want all of them to do thousands of on-chain actions a day. And we're like, okay, you know, you do the math that there's one partner like this and then another one comes on. We don't have to start turning people away when we don't have enough capacity. We want to welcome everyone to the platform and be able to just keep having a scale no matter how much traffic there is. And so this is how we came up with this new data model of SWE that allows horizontal scalability. That's the key property that we're going for here, where if you're a validator, you can run one machine and you'll get a certain amount of throughput and a certain amount of storage. But if demand spikes, then you can provision another machine. Now you've got more throughput. Now you've got more storage. And the entire network can do this to just keep growing as much as it needs to to serve the demands of the community. And importantly, like we want to do this with Web2 distributed system scaling techniques. We don't want to do some fancy decentralized sharding protocol that validators have to know about which shard other validators run. Users have to worry about details like cross shard transactions and you know see the cost that they just wanted to do something but discover that their data happened to live on different shards. So now it has a different security model or a different cost model. Users shouldn't just think, okay, here's like the global state. I throw my transaction into a pond and then the results come back to me and that's it. And our architecture lets you do that and then gives you this horizontal scalability. And so really like I think that's the thing that distinguishes Sui from all other projects and that we don't think about scalability in terms of a specific TPS number or anything like that. We think about what's the TPS we can get per machine and how do we set up the system so that we can make that number go up as much as we need to, even as demand increases. Because otherwise, like Web3 will only be as big as whatever the max TPS number a single machine or single system can handle. And we just want to make sure we have the flexibility to handle whatever folks are going to throw at us. And this is more of a philosophical position, but it goes deeply into system design, into why we've done what we've done and what we're targeting. And even the things like the developer community where people will be like, oh, you know, the EVM has network effects, like you should have done Solidity and the EVM and SWE. And then we will look at the numbers and see there's 4,000 developers who are building on the EVM, but this is a small number compared to 16 million JavaScript developers or 12 million iOS developers. And if you want a large developer community to be building the next generation of apps to the world, you're really going to need a lot more than 4,000. So we need a strategy for developer acquisition that brings in folks from the mainstream and grows the pie of smart contract developers, not just convinces folks to switch. So in everything we're doing, we're really thinking about like the next millions and billions of users and how to make crypto a big thing and not something that's a bit more niche. The final question is we actually had from our forms that we reviewed. We have quite a few that have come through our bench. Could you spare a little bit of time, Sam, to go through a few of them? Of course. I think this is a, a fun one. It's the first one that actually came up. Solarius wrote out that he was writing a book on mood patterns. He's asking who came up with hot potato and who should he credit? <laughs> But yeah, hot potato. Um, so we talked about this a long time ago at a Facebook. I'm trying to remember a lot of these ideas, like different move team members come up with it simultaneously and then like kick it around and then we figure out how it'll work. I think I might have had the broad idea of hot potato, but there's a specific way it's used with Move's ability system. And the ability system was designed by Todd Nowacki, who is also the one who built the Move compiler uh, and works with us in this end. You probably heard him in an AMA earlier. So I would give credit for hot potato to Todd. Like the idea of having something that you're forced to use is nice, but like really the, the type system feature that allows you to do that in a really flexible and extensible way uh, is all about abilities. And I think Todd's the one who should get credit for that. But with that, like everything with Move, like this is a team effort. We bounce ideas off each other and come up with the best version of something. And what do you think about the future of testing with SWE Move? Will it be more, you know, based off of writing in Move? Or do you think people will develop hard hat like frameworks to write in languages that are other than Move? Yeah, so we already have a unit testing framework where you can write tests in Move. And I think that'll continue to be the most popular way to test your Move code. In the Ethereum community, folks started off, uh, as the questioner mentions, using things like hard hat, where you write tests in JavaScript or somewhere else. But I think the over time, the community is like, we really want to be able to write tests directly in Solidity. And you have newer frameworks like Foundry that let you do that, that are growing a lot of popularity, I think, are the experience that people prefer. So in Move, uh, we understood this, and we started right away with a testing framework that lets you write tests in Move. So I think that'll continue would be the most popular thing. We have some features that we'll work on adding to that, like symbolic parameters that you can write fuzz tests directly and move. Of course, we have the move prover, which lets you go beyond testing, you know, in testing, you're seeing if the contract works for a particular input or set of inputs. But when you're using the prover, it's testing that it works for all possible inputs, all possible transactions, all possible program that are leaving. So you can get a lot more leverage out of your developer and testing effort than you can with writing tests. Of course, this doesn't replace the need for tests. You should have both, but it lets you check things that are very, very hard to check with tests, particularly if you're worried about 
about adversarial behavior or things that you didn't anticipate. I think the future of testing and move is growing the nice unit testing framework that we already have to support fancy new things like us testing, but then also really the prover. Any formal verification tool is a, a never ending research problem. You're trying to solve the halting problem. And so you can never concretely do that, but you can asymptotically approach perfection. Uh, it's at a very good place, but I think making it work better and better and letting you specify a richer set of properties and running faster. Like these are things that we'll always be working on uh, and, are, and are excited to be working on. So you mentioned Prover. We have another question where we're being asked, does the move Prover work fine with SWE move? Are there any changes that have to be made? And are there also sources for learning the Prover? So we can break down the three questions. But the first one is really, you know, how does the move Prover work with SWE move? And are there any changes that have to be made? Yes, so it does work, and we're working on integrating it into our build process for the SWE framework, which is the set of standard modules, basically like the SWE standard library that all SWE smart contract authors need to write. The main difference with SWE move is that a lot of fancy things that the prover is doing has to do with the storage model of core move, which is this global type based map. And in SWE move, we take that whole feature away and the associated complexity. So you don't need to write those specs in SWE move. So in SWE move, you can write things like data invariance, like you have a counter, you can write a spec that says the value of this counter counter is always increasing, and then you have a function, you can write pre and post conditions that are checked by the prover. I imagine there's going to be some SWE specific prover extensions that could be interesting to look into. I mentioned this feature of parent and child objects. You might want to be able to say things in prover specifications about the parent-child relationships between objects. Like maybe this object is always the child of this parent, or this parent has three children, or things along those lines. Those we haven't added yet and will require prover extensions, but I think it'll really be driven by what kind of specifications do SWE move programmers need to write, and uh, we'll make sure that we have both the right expressive specification language for that and the prover, and then also the, the backend support for checking these properties. And then I think there's a sub question here about learning the best resources for learning the prover. So I think there's a, a user guide, maybe if there's someone in the audience, they can drop this link. There's a user guide in the move documentation. Uh, I think it's probably linked to from the move book. And if not, it's under the move prover GitHub repo. But I think this is something that we're going to need to work more on in the future. Like any verification tool, the move prover is somewhat easy to get into, but the advanced usages of it require some more study and hand-holding, and so that's certainly something that we can help with. I think the best way to do that is example-driven, so that's why we're really prioritizing getting examples of move specs into the SWE framework so that folks who are building on top of the SWE framework can imitate what's going on there and then get deeper into the prover as it makes sense for them. Also happy to drop that resource in the event chat after it closes, and we'll also include a lot of these links when we have our wrap-up blog post for people who are wondering about these resources. So don't worry if you're listening in, we will share these out after this is over. Additional question we received is what's the key differentiator of Move from Rust in a practical way? So there might be an implicit assumption on this that I want to call out where a question I get all the time is like, why not Rust versus Move for smart contract development? And my answer to this question is Rust is not a smart contract language. Like the key thing to recognize here is that for a smart contract language, you have something that's actually published on chain and then that's what the validators run. And so like for the EVM, that's EVM bytecode. And for us, that's Move bytecode. But Rust doesn't have an equivalent of Move bytecode. It's a source language that to actually run it, you have to run the compiler, you go through LLVM and then you get out machine code or WASM or something else like that. And so in addition, as I talked about before with these table stakes properties for smart contract languages, there are things that you have to have to be a smart contract language that Rust doesn't have. Rust doesn't have accounts. Rust doesn't have coins. Rust doesn't have a, a built-in model for persistent storage. And so if you're going to try to use Rust for smart contract development, like say Solana does, you're not actually using Rust as a smart contract language. What you have is an SDK or an API for a smart contract language that happens to be embedded in Rust, but that you could just as well embed an API in Python or in Java or something else. And then sometimes you're going to use Rust features, like say, hash maps that have non-deterministic iteration, and then those won't be able to be usable in a smart contract language. It gets at this thing that I mentioned before of, it would be great to be able to use a general purpose language as a smart contract language. We actually looked at using Rust before we created Move, but there are just differences and properties the language needs to have to be a smart contract language that Rust just doesn't have. So with that said, we love Rust. All of SWE is written in Rust, and there are a lot of aspects of Move that are strongly influenced by Rust. What we tried to do basically is take the things folks really love about Rust development uh, and the experience, and then make those present both syntactically and semantically in the language. We've also tried to very aggressively simplify where Rust does something complex because it needs to be a low-level systems language where you can write efficient compilers and operating systems, whereas like Move is never going to be used for that. Uh, Move is for smart contracts. So basically, we try to take the good parts of Rust, but then do this aggressive simplification to make Move much more approachable uh, in any way that we can. And what are your thoughts on scalability once the chain is exponentially greater in size, especially when it comes to throughput and the amount of time to verify it? 
Right. So I talked a little bit about the throughput part earlier, but I'll expand on that and then talk about the time to verify it, which is a very relevant question. So for throughput, as I mentioned before, our strategy here is that let me go into a little bit more detail on how this works. Like the way a transaction looks in SWE is it declares the object that's going to operate on. And then the only thing that the runtime needs in order to execute the transaction is the values of those objects. It then runs the move code that's reading those objects, writing them, updating them, whatever. And then it produces some effects that need to be applied to the database again. So as you need more throughput, all you need to do is once your database grows beyond a single machine or like your executor grows beyond a single machine, you just partition the objects across those machines. And then when a new transaction comes in, you can say, okay, this transaction sent by Sam, let's go to the shard where Sam's objects live and we can execute that transaction there. And so that makes it easy. And then Jen's transaction will come in. We'll send Jen's transaction to the shard where Jen's objects live. And then that can be entirely executed there with no cross shard reads necessary. And then you can just keep adding more and more machines to the scheme and you keep getting more throughput. At least that's the idea. And then there's the validation part of this where it's great for validators to be able to add more machines and get more throughput, but it's not ideal if as an end user who wants to check the work of the validators, I now need to run a micro cluster. That's not going to be great for decentralization. I think there's a problem that a lot of folks building high throughput chains don't think about. They're like, yeah, it's going to be expensive to run validators and full nodes, just deal with it. We think that's okay. And in fact, fundamental for validators, like, you know, you can't get more throughput without adding more computing power. But for decentralization, you really want a large ecosystem of folks who can officially check what's happening in the chain and make sure the validators aren't doing anything malicious. So in SWE, we have this notion, the way we solve this problem is we have a notion of a sparse node that leverages the SWE transaction model. And with a sparse node, you say there's a certain set of addresses or objects, we call them causal roots, they can be either of those things that I'm going to track. And I'll track and re-execute and validate all transactions and state that are relevant to these objects or these addresses, but not the rest of the state. And so for example, every wallet is a sparse node that tracks the objects that are owned by that wallet and whatever else the, the wallet happens to care about. Or if you're a game developer, developer who's running a game server, you might have a sparse node that tracks the state of all your players and like your game admin objects and like the game state, but not the state of some other game or the state of a DEX or some other thing that's not relevant to you. And so collectively, everyone can validate the transactions in the state that are relevant to their use case but without paying for the cost of validating everything, you know, the many tens of millions potentially of transactions that are going on in the system. And so this is a really nice way to scale this validation because fundamentally the cost of your validation is going to be proportional to the amount of state that you care about. And for most end users, that's probably small. And for use cases like a game, it depends on basically how big their game is. And so it's appropriate that they pay for that. So we think this is a super important thing. Bull nodes in networks today only really scale because TPS is really, really low. So anyone who's running a high throughput chain is going to need to have some good answer to this problem that allows you to scale validation. Otherwise, uh, your decentralization is going to suffer a lot as your throughput goes up, which you don't want. I'll throw an easy final question if you still, I think we still have a little bit of time. For you, Sam, what are you personally excited about seeing built on Swee's move that you couldn't or shouldn't necessarily try to accomplish with? with validity. So I'm very excited about next generation NFTs without standards. And so what I mean by this is that when you have something like ERC721 or 1155, we think it caters to the lowest common denominator where every NFT has to satisfy these rules. And so if you want to do something like I have an NFT with some metadata that can be mutated, that has to be yet another standard that the community gets together and agrees on. And then it can only be mutated in ways that cater to the least common denominator of what everyone wants to do. Whereas in Swede, one way to think about it is that every object is an NFT. Every object has a unique idea. ID, which is one of the key things of 721, and every object has this built-in transfer functionality, as I described. And then so what you want to do beyond that is up to you. You can add new fields to your NFT. You can have logic for updating them. You can wrap your NFT and other NFTs. You know, you can do this parent-child object thing. I think it just really takes off the handcuffs in terms of what you can do with digital objects and makes it much, much easier to do this safely and quickly. And I'm very excited to see what creators are going to do with this once they're freed from these shackles of trying to conform to these restrictive standards and just try to do uh, the limited things that every Everyone wants to do in common and just instead focus on what they want to create from an NFT and a digital asset perspective. I think that's going to be extremely interesting, especially when you couple it with the low cost and the scaling capabilities of SWE uh, and the nice developer experience we have with Move. And there's a reason, right, why SWE's line is basically building without boundaries. So really excited to see what comes up as people, you know, create on the platform that we're launching shortly. In the interim, I'm fully aware of the time. Thank you so much, Sam, for, you know, giving us your time, walking us through Move programming language. Next week, we are right now 
finalizing with a few people, but it will be a different topic that's non-move related. But know that the week after, we will have something that's tied to this. In the interim, if you have any additional questions, please continue sharing it with our event chat, as well as our Twitter account, and we'll be sure to bring that question up in another AMA series. Any last words, Sam? Not for me. Thank you so much, and thanks to our community for your great questions. This was a lot of fun for me. We'll do another series soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and uh, we'll also send the information out as well as the recorded link. Have fun. Bye.